The biggest benefit of living in Amsterdam is that you have the, the possibilities of a, of a big metropole, but the atmosphere of a, of a, of a small village. Uh, my name is Ruben Bander. I own an art gallery and I'm a chef. Today I'm going to take you to my favorite spots in Amsterdam. We are standing on the Southern Church Tower. And you, behind this tower I grew up and the house right over there is my parents' house, it still is. And now I live like 100 meters that way. Hey Ma, can you one more time swim? Yeah, you can see my mask waving right over there and yelling. Hi! Hello, kids! <laughs> Amsterdam is built up through canals. And within the first canal, that's the area where we are right now. So it's the oldest part of the city. What really, really keeps me here is I know every inch, every stone of it. I know every. I think I do. But I still, after 25 years, I still discover things when I'm walking around here. So it's, it's never dull. It's, uh, well, and it's beautiful. Well, we are now in the, the center of the Newmarket area, the actual Newmarket. You can see it's one of the oldest parts of Amsterdam. If you look at the houses and every, every, everything comes together here. And now we're gonna have my first coffee of the day. We're gonna do that at Latay, it's my favorite coffee bar, it's just around the corner. Let's go. You have the best coffee in Amsterdam? Can have that here. You can have very nice sandwiches and fruit juices and everything. And the fun fact is that you can buy everything here, what you see. So this vase or this table or this chair or all the lamps that you see on top of the ceiling and the, everything is for sale. This is one of the most beautiful parts in Amsterdam because of the diversity. With lots of shops for clothing, coffee bars, sandwich shops, and it's Chinatown as well. There's happening stuff here all the time. It's fun. So here's where I drink my coffee, but if you're looking for something stronger, like Geneva, you can go to the best Geneva bar in town, which is just around the corner. This is uh, a Geneva bar called uh, In the Olofsport, in one of the really the oldest buildings in Amsterdam. They have more than 60 uh, Genevas here. So in combination with this old building to drink this really old classical Dutch distillate is, well, it's fun. It's, it's nice to drink it in, in an environment like this, like a brown cafe, where nothing really has changed for the past 400 years, except for electricity and stuff. <laughs> we are now in a public courtyard. There are approximately 10 courtyards like this, which are open for the public. There are way more like places like this in Amsterdam. Only 10 are open where you just can walk in and relax and take in the silence. You don't hear the trams or the, or the traffic or the noises. So it's like going back in time when you, when you walk in a, a courtyard like this. We are now here at an old steam mill factory. They have built a cultural center in it. So you have theater, you have uh, exhibitions, you have a very nice restaurant, cafe, kind, some kind of supermarket dish. You have a beach, a city beach, it's really nice. This is the way I want to spend my summer, because from the water, Amsterdam is even more beautiful than when you're walking down the street. There are multiple choices you can have, like this one beside us, or you can rent a boat yourself, if you know how to handle one. We are now going to a restaurant, and we're going to have a small boat ride and then have dinner.
the restaurant Ram Island is um, is a former illegal broadcasting island. It lasted for a month, and then it uh, uh, it had been rusting for 40 years in the North Sea. And they did, then they dismantled it and put it back together here in Amsterdam. It's a really nice, easygoing, french oriented restaurant. The food is good, it's not too expensive, and the view is, uh, is amazing. After we're done eating, we're going to the Club Trouw, which is, the, I think, the best club in Amsterdam. It's in a, an old building where they made newspapers until 10 years ago or something. Then it was empty for a couple of years, and then they built a club in it. It's big and it has the same atmosphere as Rem Island. It has, it has its raw edges. And um, well, during the Amsterdam Dance Event in October, if you go there, you have the biggest headliners. I can recommend it. If you want to get to know Amsterdam, take a week. Not a day or two days, just come by and have a good time. So I'm going to have a party and uh, maybe I'll see you at the Trouw. So goodbye. The other day I was in Florence walking on the street, which I'm doing every day, but suddenly I realized, wow, I'm in Florence. That's what Florence is giving to me. Everything amazes me a little bit more. Ciao, my name is Marco Badiani. I am the director of the Florentine, the English language newspaper in Florence. And today we are at the top of the Astoria Hotel, enjoying the, this Florence landscape. Now in Florence is very happening rooftops, so I think it's worth see what you can see. Florence born all around uh, its river, the River Arno. Florence got an enormous grow around two main uh, uh, activities: wool and banks. This allowed in the 13th century to to start its growing and a lot of uh, the Duomo start to be built in that time and other very important buildings start that time. Then it got a boost. It got a boost with the, with the, the period we call Renaissance and, and with the coming to the power of the, the Medici family. The Medici family influenced, uh, influenced the Renaissance heavily because they put a lot of money invested in supporting artists. So. We can say they were like the, the, the big founders of Renaissance. That's the bridge that brings us on the Old Trano. This is Piazza Pitti and this is the Pitti Palace. This neighborhood is the Old Trano. It's very peaceful and relaxed. On the contrary, on the right bank of the Arno where there is a lot of big chain and more touristic. Here there is less people, more uh, Relax, uh, slow, slow motion. Let me say, you can find a lot of uh, artisan, artist uh, atelier, vintage shop, nice restaurants, and it's also the place where a lot of the young people it's hang out in the evenings to have fun, uh, drinks, or just stay on the street with uh, uh, with friends. We're here at the Pitti Mosaici workshop and we're seeing a technique that is very interesting because it comes directly from they were building their chapel uh, behind uh, San Lorenzo. It's based on a, on a semi-precious and uh, hard stone inlay technique. So it's like uh, a little bit seeing uh, people, people from the Renaissance working. So this is a kind of workshop you can find in Otrarno, where you can still find the real production of, uh, of shoes. So if you have strange food or strange taste or luxury taste, you can bespoke your shoes and they handmade, they take the shape of your food, keep in the archive so it will be always for you and you decide the leather, the color, the shape, what you want and you have your unique pair of shoes. This is a really something old travel style. We are here in the, in the 
the, in the general market uh, in the center of Florence, in the San Lorenzo area. It's come from the beginning of uh, the end of the 19th century. People meet in the, at the market. I'm going to have it. Very good. That's yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So we're going to have a, a Lampredotto panino. Lampredotto. Sweet, sale pepe, sale pepe, sale pepe. Sí. Salsa verde y un poco de salsa picante. We're going to eat uh, uh, lamprodotto panino, which is uh, very ty well, typical. Grazie. It's a very typical uh, Florence panino. It's the fourth part of the stomach of the cow. Here started as a poor food, and now it's traditionally very in trend in Florence. You have to taste it because it's a, it's a really special, special consistency and uh, flavor. Hmm, you want to taste? Here we are inside the Santo Spirito, a church designed by Filippo Brunelleschi. It was uh, um, maybe one of the first uh, buildings built uh, starting from a floor plan. And because uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, we can say, uh, is uh, maybe was one of the first architect of, of history. He likes simple things. And so the main feeling you have in this church is a great harmony and everything is well proportionated. The Michelangelo cruise that is, we're going to see right now, it's something that has been rediscovered recently in 1960. They find the crucifix who was completely painted in green, most probably to protect it from the view and the recognition of others, like uh, others in camera, like Napoleon's, to be taken from him. So at that time was uh, uh, restored and now it's uh, maybe one of the most important pieces in the church. We are here in front of Palanerli by Filippino Lippi. In general, you find this kind of, of paintings, this kind of masterpiece in to museums more than into church. But here we, we're lucky we have in Santo Spirito the possibilities to see a painting like that. We can enjoy the beauty and be inspired by that. Everybody can come to Santo Spirito. It's a church in Italy, all the church are open to public. They can come and, have, and visit and enjoy the masterpieces. Uh, behind us, we have the Vasari Corridor, one of the masterpieces in Florence. It's actually a passageway that the Medici Grand Duke used uh, and their family used to, pa to walk in the city unnoticed. At the time of the Medici, when Vasari built up the Corridoio, butchers used to be there, but the Grand Duke and the Duke, that uh, they feel that not very nice, uh, a perfume coming from the scratches of the butchers and they decide to change with another activity so that's why we have jewelers now. Recently it's become a hot stuff, the, uh, the Vasari Corridor, because it's been mentioned by uh, the latest book of Dan Brown, Inferno, and the protagonists were used the, the Corridoio to escape from Palazzo Pitti to uh, Palazzo Vecchio. The Vasari Corridor belongs to the uh, Uffizi Gallery, but has a, a limited access. So go online and, uh, and check how to book it. So a good day in Florence, and a happy ending for a good day in Florence is an aperitivo, where you can have good food, good drinks, and good music. I came here at the Rivalta because I love to have the sunset on the Arno. The aperitivo is like an happy hour, but with food, so you have a fantastic drink uh, with a buffet, you can enjoy pasta, sandwich, etc, etc. And in, uh, you can have in Florence in uh, many bars, every corner of Florence offer different aperitivo. It's a very nice uh, night out you can have with uh, your friends. You can go to Rome, you can go to Venice, you can go to Milano, but you have to taste Florence. Ciao.
The first time I came to Paris, I was a student. I just came for the weekend and I didn't really know what to expect. And I fell in love with it immediately. The streets, the cafes, the atmosphere, it really spoke to me. And I thought, oh, maybe I was French in another life. And that's when I knew that I would live here one day, somehow, at some point in my life. And uh, life did bring me here. Uh, my name is Kasha Dietz and I'm a handbag designer. I also write a blog called Love in the City of Lights. I'm from New York and um, I've traveled quite a bit but I've lived in New York for uh, over 12 years and uh, one day I met a handsome Italian who was living in Paris and I decided to join him to live our story. Uh, we're here on the Seine on uh, Ile Saint Louis. The Seine is um, kind of the main waterway and it's really the heart of Paris. This is actually a very romantic place. Uh, in the summer, there's picnickers everywhere. It's actually one of my favorite parts of Paris. In Paris, it's kind of like stepping into the past. It's quiet and serene and romantic and beautiful. We're now at the Marché Saint-Ouen, which is actually the largest flea market in the world. We're at the Vernaison, which is the oldest of the markets out of the 15 that are here. This one has uh, the oldest treasures. This market's very known to have a mix of various items, um, making it one of the most traditional markets. There's all sorts of treasures to find in the 3,000 some odd stalls and shops that are here. You could spend your day lost amidst all this history and all these beautiful antiques. This is uh, Chez Loisette, which is one of the oldest uh, cafes, restaurants here in the market. Great for traditional French food and um, just an interesting ambiance. You have, you really feel like you step back into time. <laughs> We're now in a Place de la République. It connects three uh, great neighborhoods of Paris. So we're just on the border of the North Marais where I live and where I'll um, happily give you a tour. The Marais became popular in the 60s. However, the North Marais was um, not really recognized. And just in the last six, seven years, it's really changed a lot and it's become a destination. My favorite spot in North Marais, there's so many. Um, I love uh, Marché des Enfants de Rouge, which is the oldest covered market in Paris. It's really, uh, it's really the neighborhood market that everyone kind of congregates to and, and comes to eat lunch and have a drink. This area is also considered to be very bobo. Uh, bourgeois bohème. Bourgeois bohème is a term that is uh, used to identify kind of a certain type of Parisian who is both bourgeois, which is the more kind of upscale, elegant, and the bohème, which is the artist. Ça va? Ça va bien. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? This store is one of the places that I think about when I think of North Marais and kind of the feeling of the North Marais. It's art and fashion coming together. This store also chose my bags as part of his select group of um, artists displaying their work here, since some of my bags are hand-painted and all of my bags are wearable art, you could say. We're now at Merci, which is um, a great concept shop in the North Marais. They created a little world here, and uh, all the proceeds go to charity, so that's the concept. It's very philanthropic. We're now at the Fondation Henri Cartier-Bresson, who is um, a very, one of the most recognized French photographers and also the father of photojournalism. And we're here um, at the, which was once an atelier, which is now uh, the home of all of his work, which he opened the year before he uh, passed away. He's actually one of the first to really capture candid uh, shots in photography, so it makes him very unique. And I, there's a quote of his that I really love. Taking a photograph is putting one's head, one's heart, and one's eye on the same axis. So Paris is the city of love. 
uh, for many reasons. The, the, the architecture, the buildings, it kind of speaks of these stories of history and it's actually um, embraced to walk with somebody and it has the setting for romance. This is um, one of the first restaurants where my husband brought me when I moved to Paris. So I have great memories of it and uh, we like to come here often for romantic evenings. So I hope you enjoyed my tour of Paris. Come back again and fall in love with the City of Lights. Au revoir. St. Petersburg is definitely not like any other city in Russia. It is very special. It's so European from one point of view. And at the same time, it keeps its Russian soul. My name is Anastasia, I'm a film director. I work on the local TV channel here. We're discovering the city every day. We are shooting the stories about the city, about the characters of the city, and I hope I can share some of these stories. Yeah! Rooftop is a special thing for anybody who lives in St. Petersburg. We all are striving to get to the rooftop and see the city from this bird's view. And uh, well, there are many rooftops that are hidden, like you don't know the ways, but everybody has its own way. On the way to the roof, there are always some discoveries. Never know what you're going to find there. That's nice to investigate and find it. This roof where we are now, this is Loft Project Tadaji. Uh, we're having a beautiful view from here to the center. I think if uh, somebody wants to have a date, then the guy will ask the girl to go to the rooftop because you can see the whole city from there, it's an unusual view. You can ask locals, maybe somebody will tell you its own secret roof and show you the way. I mean, you have to experience it, it's something to do here. <laughs> this city still has the reflections of the Soviet Union time, you still can feel it. Now it's a new age, so you can feel both of it, you can feel the history that was during the Bolsheviks' time, you can feel the history of the Tsar's time, and now the new generation came. It's more like European, they're more liberal, they're more open to new ideas. Welcome to New Holland. It's an island built by Peter the Great. It has a long history, and it was a navy island, but now it's a multicultural space where you can have a rest, where you can walk, and you can even get organic food here, here and land your own vegetables and if you want you can even join the yoga classes. Another special thing to do is to see the city from the river view. You can choose the boat that you prefer but we decided to skip the touristic boat and come to a charter boat. In the beginning of 18th century, Peter the Great had this idea to make a new capital for Russia and um, he wanted to make it right here, next to the Baltic Sea, to have the window to Europe. He was inspired by Amsterdam with its channels and he loved Poland so much. And he wanted to use all of this experience, European experience he had. And um, his friends were telling him, and all the people around were telling that you're crazy, you can't make a city here because it's a swamp. Still, he built the city and it was 320 years ago. I think Peter the Great probably was the most charismatic character in our history. And even if we understand now that maybe he was so cruel and um, maybe it was too much the way he made all his reforms, still I think we love him and we respect him.